density is the mass of an object over its volume. The denser object will be on the bottom if they're placed on top of each other and they're both liquids or one's a liquid and one's a solid. The density of an object does not change if it's in its same form. So it doesn't matter if I have five grams of a substance or a thousand grams of a substance. If it's both in its solid form, it's gonna have the same density. Because of that, we can have problems like this where it says the water has a density of one gram per milliliter. It can also help you identify what your substance is if you can determine its density. So in this problem, it says I have 150 milliliters, so how many milligrams does it weigh? The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is start off with the 150 milliliters. You could set up the density equation and rearrange, in which case we get mass is equal to D times V. But just starting with the number they gave us and setting up a, setting up a dimensional analysis table, we know milliliters has to go on bottom and grams has to go on top. How density gets plugged in is the one goes with grams, so wherever grams is, is where your density number is gonna go. In this case, it was a one. Nothing is with milliliters, so I just leave it blank. If it makes you feel better, you can put a one down there, but it's unneeded. Then, since I have my grams canceling out, or my milliliters canceling out, but I want milligrams, I need to put grams on the bottom so it'll cancel. Finally, milligrams on top. From our previous lessons, we know that the one is gonna go with the larger unit, which is grams in this case. And there's a thousand milligrams or 10 to the third milligrams in a gram. So multiplying across, we get D or 1.5 times 10 to the fifth milligrams. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Remember that you're always gonna start with either the mass or the volume. In this problem, the density is a conversion factor. We want our answer in one unit, so I have to start with just one unit. So same thing on here, I have one unit, which is volume, and I have density. So you'd have to start with a 36.5. So pause the video, restart when you have your answer. So you should have started with 36.5 centimeters cubed. Centimeters cubed goes on bottom. And I can go from centimeters cubed to grams through density. I have 7.87 with grams and I have nothing with centimeters cubed. So again, I can just leave that blank. Or if I want, I can put a one there. My question says how many grams, therefore I'm done. I just need to multiply that out. For sig figs, I'm gonna look at my volume, not the density, since density is a constant. So we have three sig figs, so one, two, three, that seven is gonna stay a seven, and so our final answer is 287 grams. Remember, you also could have said that the formula is mass over volume. Rearranging, I would have gotten mass is equal to density times volume, just like the last problem. Notice my volume and density are just being multiplied. So if the dimensional analysis confuses you, then technically you can solve it algebraically, but you wanna make sure that you're canceling your units. That's the most important thing, to make sure that you're in the proper unit and that your algebra was correct. One more problem, go ahead and restart the volume once you've solved this one. So on this problem, we have our density is equal to mass over volume, and we're trying to find what the density is. So I need to know the mass, and I need to know the volume. They didn't give you the volume, they gave you some lab data. They said originally it was 30, then you placed it into the water, the object, and now it's 75. So the volume of the unknown object is the difference in volume, because that difference has to be due to the object and they gave you the mass. So it's just 60 grams over 45 milliliters. None of my units are canceling. So I just put them on top of each other. 
and that should have given you C, 1.33 grams. In proper sig figs, that should have just been 1.3. To convert between Celsius and Kelvin, you add 273 to the Celsius temperature. If you were going from Kelvin to Celsius, you would subtract 273. So for this first problem, I'm given Celsius and I'm trying to get to Kelvin. So if you add 273, you'll get 329 Kelvin. Notice there's no degree sign. When I'm trying to go from Kelvin to Celsius, I subtract 273, giving me 507 degrees Celsius. Go ahead and pause the video and do these two on your own. Restart when you have your answers. So the first one, subtracting 273, you get negative 83. And then adding 273 to negative 93 should have given you 180 Kelvin. Celsius can be positive or negative. Kelvin is always positive. That takes us to classification of matter. Make sure that in your notes you're drawing these particle diagrams. So an element is matter composed of only one type of atom. Sometimes it helps visually if you circle all the different types of matter present to figure out if it's an element, a compound, or a mixture. I can only circle one type of particle. They're all the same. Therefore, this must be either an element or compound because those are both pure pieces of our pure matter. The one on the right, again, I can only circle one type of particle. They're together, but it's only one type of particle. That one particle is composed of only one type of atom, so that's also an element. So elements can be monatomic, which is this picture on the left, or diatomic, which is this picture in the middle. You could also have 30 of the same element or eight, like sulfur generally forms eight of the same atom. Compounds. So I have one type of particle. There are different types of atoms, but only one type of particle. And the one on the right, again, two types of atoms, but only one particle. So these are both examples of compounds. They're pure substances, meaning I can only circle one type of particle that chemically join that consist of more than one type of atom. While mixtures are going to be two or more substances which are not chemically bonded. So going with that same concept, I have one particle. I have another particle. Oh, I have two circles, which means this must be a mixture because they're not chemically bound together. And in this one, I have, again, two types of particles. So the picture on the right, I have an element and a compound. So this is a mixture of elements and compounds. And the picture on the right, this is an element and this is an element. So that's a mixture of elements. You can also see it in macro scale, like a fruit salad would be a mixture. You can see the different pieces. Or here it looks like maybe iron and salt. Again, two different substances. Mixtures can be further classified into hom homogeneous or homogeneous mixtures, which are mixtures that are uniform, and heterogeneous mixtures, mixtures that are not uniform. If you dissolve salt in water, that's going to make a homogeneous mixture. You can't see the salt in the water anymore, but if you tasted it, you could taste the two pieces. And then oil and water is going to be a heterogeneous. They're going to make different layers. As far as particle diagrams go, we can see that the green and orange spheres are randomly mixed. They're also not bound together, so it's definitely not a compound. And then on the right would be a gas that's again uniformly mixed. On the bottom, we have different layers on top or bottom, or maybe they're on different sides of the container, but it's very obvious that we have different layers. It's not an even mix. So go ahead and pause the video, figure out if these are elements, pure compound, a mixture of elements, a mixture of compounds, or a mixture of elements and compounds. Your choices are on the bottom. Restart when you have your answers, and it may be beneficial to circle the different particles just like we did on the practice. So for the first one, we had two types of particles. 
This one's an element and that's an element. So that's a mixture of elements. For the second one, you just had one type of particle. And those are two different types of atoms. So that would be a compound. For the third one, you had two types of particles. Both of them were elements. So that's a mixture of elements. The fourth one, one type of particle. And those are the same type of atom. Therefore, it must be an element. For these solids, they're a little bit more complicated. But we have one type of atom, and it's just repeating. So this is an element in its solid form. For the next one, you've got to look closely and say, is it a regular repeating unit? If you look, we have black and white, black and white, white and black, white and black black and white, black and white. So this is the smallest repeating unit and it's the same all the way through the compound. So this is a compound. Well, the next one, you have two different particles. Unlike the last example, it's not a regular repeating unit. I don't have white, black, white, black. So this would be a mixture of elements. This is an element and that's an element and they're mixed together. And further classification would be a heterogeneous mixture because it's not uniformly mixed. I only have a couple of the black circles and the white. And the last one, you wanted to look carefully because you have two types of particles. One that is one black square, one open square, and one that's two open squares and one black square. In which case, this one is a compound and that's a compound, so this is a mixture of compounds. With mixtures, there are three different ways you can separate a mixture. We can do distillation, which is separating a solution with different boiling points. Filtration, which is to separate a solid and a liquid mixture and chromatography, which is going to be used to separate mixtures based on their polarity. You could also separate mixtures if one was magnetic and one was not with a magnet, or if the pieces were large enough, you could physically separate them with your hands. But if those other two methods don't work, then these are our main three ways of separating mixtures. So here's some examples of filtration. On the left is the one we use most often, and that's just a normal filtration system. In the beaker, you'd have a suspension of solid and liquid. Anytime you're filtering, you're separating heterogeneous mixtures. So you may want to make note on that. So you had your suspension of a solid and liquid. You're going to pour that through a filter paper. The solid is going to get stuck in the filter paper, and then the liquid goes through. The liquid that goes through is referred to as the filtrate. Had this been, let's say, sand, salt, and water, Anything that's dissolved in the water will go through and be part of the filtrate. So then I may have another mixture that needs to be further separated. I can also use a separatory funnel if I had two liquids where they were separated by polarity. So maybe one layer is polar and one layer is not, kind of like oil and water. The more dense substance would be on the bottom layer and I can use a separatory funnel to separate them based on this immensibility. Immensible means they won't mix. Distillation is used to separate a homogeneous mixture, homogeneous mixture, based on its boiling point. So you have your homogeneous mixture, it starts to boil. As it boils, the gas goes up. And then it starts going through this tube. This tube has water around it, which cools the tube and then eventually turns it into a liquid by condensation. And then that mixture goes over here or that boiling point. The next boiling point occurs and then the next substance starts coming out. And you can switch the Sirlemeyer on the right. And finally, chromatography 
is another way of separating a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture. You can think of ink. So this is our more common way of paper chromatography. You'd put your filter paper in with water or any polar or nonpolar solvent, and then you have your ink. In this case, since it's water, the substance that's most similar to water is gonna travel the most with the water or the solvent. The thing that is least polar would be more attracted to the paper and stay at the bottom. So looking at these colors, I can see that the blue ink is the most polar and the yellow is the least polar of the three. We'll talk more about chromatography in class when we talk about polarities.